there's just something weird about you. Pat's Two Cents, we are God's Church of Love online. We are reading from Matthew 9 and Judges chapter 7. There are times when we feel like the odd man out. Weird people like Peter. <laughs> Weird people, even weirder like Pat. <laughs> now, I'm saying that to be funny. Because the one thing that we often feel, I felt it all my life, we often feel like we either don't fit in, we don't fit in with the unsaved when we were unsaved, we don't fit in with the saved after we get saved, we don't fit in with our families quite like everyone else does. There's just something weird about you and something weird about me. And we try to figure out what is wrong with me. And we don't get that there, that is part of God's programming because of the way he wants to use you in the end time harvest. You've got to be a little bit on the weird side. You just have to be. There's no other way. And this is why. This will explain what is wrong with you and what is wrong with me. You're going to get a clear understanding when I read this scripture. I never saw this before in Judges. But anyway, let's start with Matthew. And let me read. Then said he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Now, listen to this. <laughs> there is a calling on each and every one of our lives. God has given us supernatural Holy Ghost given gifts. And some of us don't recognize what they are. But a lot of times you deal with what burns in you, that burning passion, that thing that gets on your last, 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 ultimately last nerve. The thing that, that burns you and churns you and makes you want to rise up and, and, and do all kind of, of explosives and do all kind of damage to the injustices of life, the unjust systems, the, the unjust systems, however you say it. But there are times when you observe things going on in our world and they, they, they get up under your skin. And, and when you go to God and talk to him about it, you're almost fussing. But you're not fussing at God. You're just fussing because you don't like what you see. You want it to change. You want it to stop now. Well, a lot of that has to do with the giftings God has placed in you. A lot of the passions you have are tied in to your callings, your elections, your assignments in this world. So to share that with you, I want to go all the way back to Judges chapter 7. And this will explain to you why you don't fit. Why people see you as weird. Why some people see you as special. You're so special. And it's not meant as a compliment when they say the word special. You know, you will find that there are, when you look back in your life, all the way from childhood, and you can remember those specific moments where either kids made fun of you ostracized you, your family treats you like you are so mental, you're hopeless. Hmm. They let you talk in one ear and they trash it out the other. Why? They don't take you seriously. They see you as maybe a butt end of every joke. They're not sure how to, how to, they don't, they don't get you. It's like, what is, what is up with 
with you. So there's something weird about you. I don't know why you got to be so odd. Why can't you be like everybody else? Why can't you be normal? Huh? I know some of you have heard that. Why can't you just, why do you have to be on that high horse? You're always hammering that subject left and right. I'm tired of hearing you talk about that. I'm tired of seeing you, you get so wound up, so bent out of shape. That's not even a big deal. Ain't nobody else tripping off of that. Why you got to trip so hard? What's up with that? What's up with you? What's your problem? All right. Here's your problem. Judges chapter 7. I know you guys are saying, she read that last week. Well, we're going to read it again. How's that? And we're not going to read the whole chapter. From verse 3 to verse 7. Now, therefore, this is God talking to Gideon. Now, therefore, go to, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned of the people twenty and two thousand, and there remained ten thousand. Think of that number now. Write it down so you can see how big the number is. One zero comma zero 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 ten. Thousand, ten thousand, y'all. Think about that. That's a lot of people. And the Lord said unto to Gideon, The people are yet too many. Bring them down into the water, and I will try them there. Mm -hmm. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, This shall go with thee. The same shall go with thee, and of whomsoever I say unto thee, This shall not go with thee, the same shall not go with thee. So he brought down the people unto the water, and the Lord said unto Gideon, Everyone that lappeth of the water with his tongue, as a dog lappeth, him shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, everyone that boweth down upon his knees to drink. We already dealt with that. Bowing on your knees is a posture of worship. And people worship their appetites, their needs, their hungers, their thirst, their longings, their desires. So we got that, their flesh. Going down to verse 7. And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the 300 men that lappeth, Will I save you that brought the water up to their mouth and drank from their hand? Those are the ones that were the 300. Now compare 300 to 10,000. Think of the number. All right. I never saw this before. So I know that was for today. I will save you and deliver the Midianites into thine hand by these 300 and let all the other people go every man unto his place. So he sent the remainder of the 10,000 minus 300. That's 9,700 that went home and only 300 remain. Now, if you can do the math, write it on the paper if you can't. But that's only 300 that remain. That's what you call a very small remnant. Now, here's the part that got me. When the 10,000, when the 9,700 9, were on their knees in worship, in worship, picture, they're on their knees. They're worshiping the posture of worship. They're totally given to their thirst. They're not given to being watchful and being aware and being on, on guard and alert. No, they're not doing that. Their whole attention is given to the water. We dealt with that last week, and they were just all into it. Their faces were, some of them, their faces were in the water, just sucking it up, right? But please watch that video from last week, because that leads into this. But this right here is a difference. You get the 300, they bring the water up to their mouths. 
Do you know what set them apart? Think about this. The norm would represent the 900, excuse me, the 9,700 men that were on their knees. What do we hear in society nowadays? Well, everybody does it like that. Why do you have to be so different all the time? Why do you have to think of yourself as so unique? Why can't you just fit in with everybody else? Lynn, why can't you talk like everybody else? Why can't you walk like everybody else? Jeanette, why can't you quack like everybody else? Peter, why can't you waddle like everybody else? Everybody else does it like that. Now, why do you have to be so different? Why do you have to be so weird? Now, nobody else is pulling the water up by their mouth. Everybody's on their knees. Now, why you got to be different? Why you got to always do something totally opposite? You just like to be different than everybody else. I don't know what it is about you. You can't talk like people, like normal people. You can't dress like normal people. You can't look for the normal jobs that everybody else looks for. You always got to look for some out of space job, some, some out of this stratosphere job. You're always looking for something weird that nobody else would ever even think about. You can't just make an outfit like everybody else from a pattern. No, you got to create your own. You just think you're better than everybody else. Isn't that what it is? I know many of you have heard that. I know many of you have heard that. When Jesus says, many are called, but few are chosen. There's a reason for that, y'all. When you are part of the masses, you think like they think. You talk like they talk. You dress the way they dress. You wear your hair the way they wear their hair. You wear the makeup the way they wear their makeup. You wear your clothes the way they wear their clothes. You go to the places they go to. You watch the ball games they watch. You root for the teams they root for. You drink the beer they drink. You eat the food they eat. You're normal. You fit in well, but for those of you weirdos who don't fit in at all, the reason you don't fit is because you're, you are a critical individual thinker. You're not a follower of the masses. You lead your own pathway. You go your own way. So if everybody wants to follow the parade route and turn left on New York and right on Allen and, and go down to Colorado and turn left and turn and, and you say, you know what? I know a shortcut. Let me cut across Altadena Drive. Then somebody will criticize you and say, look, look the caravan's going that way. You're going to get us lost. Why are you going this way? Maybe you know something they don't. Why do they not know it? Because it never dawned on them to try a different route. I remember years ago, I was on the freeway. Just to show you how different thinkers do things. I was on the freeway and I was headed somewhere. And Milton, he knew how to get there. And I was telling him, Milton, traffic is really backing up. And he said, well, try a different route, baby. And I said, okay, you know of any other routes? He said, yeah. Get off the freeway and let's take such and such a street and head north. And, you know, we went through all that because he wasn't blind all his life. So he knew the roads like the back of his hand. And he got me there. And he told me, he says, get in the habit when you know a way to get home. Try different ways. Try it. He said, it'll save you from getting lost. You will always have three or four, three or four alternatives so you're not stuck in a rut and if you get stuck you can get unstuck and find a different way and get home much faster you don't have to take the same way do the same thing the same way every day go the same route every day every week every year he was the one that said that try driving a different route
Enjoy the scenery. Enjoy getting lost and finding your way back. It doesn't have to be a horrendous experience. It's an adventure. Now, a lot of you would get bent out of shape if you got off the wrong, if you passed your exit. Oh, no, what am I going to do? You turn around and get back on the freeway. Simple as that. It's not a major issue unless you make it a major issue. See, life doesn't have to be any more difficult than you allow it to be. It's your response to the challenge that creates either an adventure or a problem. It's how you look at it. It's how you react to it. And the more you pick the positive route and say, let's make this an adventure, an adventurous journey, rather than an arduous crisis, your life will be much easier lived. The challenges in your life will be much better dealt with. And you'll find much easier ways around the obstacles and the barriers that flare up in your life. Rather than getting all bent out of shape, losing your hair, having high blood pressure, developing ulcers, having all kind of nervous issues because you can't cope. But when you pray to God and you ask him to give you a witty mind, you will find that you have more ideas coming to you than if you don't ask God for his help. He can take you so far beyond yourself that yes, you will be the odd man out. You will be the one that pulls the water up to his mouth rather than getting on your knees like everybody else the way they do it. God will make you an individual thinker if you allow him to, if you ask him to. And when the ideas come to your mind, follow them. Don't be afraid to venture out. You're not going to get lost. You're on the same planet. All you got to do is turn around. Not a big deal. Now, what I want to ask you to do is start asking God to give you witty inventions. Start asking God to give you ideas that maybe you never thought of before. Let me share this with you just to give you an idea of how God will use your gifts and give you uh, a mental image of something that never occurred to you before. One day I had a cancellation at my hair salon. Customer couldn't show. So I had two hours to kill. And I'm sitting there looking out my window at a beautiful view of the mountains. And I'm sitting there uh, thinking to the Lord. And finally, I just opened my mouth and I said, you know, Lord, I'm going to get a pen and paper. And I'm going to ask you to run the day down to me. How can I make more money at this job and do less work? Can you show me? And all of a sudden, I see two people instead of one. Now, in my mind, I'm thinking I'm the one that's got to do the work. God injected another image of another person in my mind. And I'm at one chair, because I had two at the place I worked. I had one chair. Well, I'm working on my customer. And in the other chair, there was another person working on another customer of mine. Not their customer, of my customer. And I said, hmm. So I'm watching it play out in my mind. And when I am finished sewing in the weave of one customer and cutting and slicing and dicing and making the hair look really realistic, they get up and walk out the door while the other custom, the other hairdresser who's working on my customer escorts that customer, directs them over to my chair. And they sit in my chair and now they have taken out the weave they have shampooed, conditioned the hair. They have blow dried their hair. And I'm sitting there getting ready to sew the, uh, to braid and sew the hair. In the meantime, while I'm sewing the hair and finishing up, putting in the fine touches, another customer comes in and sits in the other chair 
and the other hairdressers taking that weave out. I'm telling you, I saw the whole thing played out. Why? Because I asked God. That's why I asked God. And he shows me this whole scenario. She's taking the weave out. She's unsewing. She's unbraiding. She's combing it out. She's taking them over to the bowl, shampooing them. I'm finishing up my customer. And after she shampoos, conditions, and blow dries, my customer's getting up out of her chair saying bye-bye after paying me. And this customer's sitting in my chair for me to braid and sew. I was able to fit. Instead of doing two or three weaves in one day and being wiped out, I could do five or six for the same time because someone else is helping me. And God was showing me, this is what you call working with an assistant. And it never dawned on me to have an assistant. So what I'm trying to share with you is God will give you a way where there is no way. He'll give you ideas where you have no for, no memory, no form of reference to go by. He will give you the idea. And I don't know why I'm breaking this down to you so much like this, but somebody out there, it's trying to figure out how to get from point A to point B. And you need to sit down and ask God to show you. I never worked in my life at a hair salon, never went to a hair salon where I watched a, a hairdresser with an assistant. Never saw that ever. Never dawned on me that I could do that until I asked God to show me how to make more money doing less work. What I'm trying to share with you, and that's what judges are sharing. If you, uh, if you are determined to be an individual thinker, an originator rather than a follower, my father used to call it setting the trend rather than following the trend. You will find that nobody else can do quite what you do the way you do. To this day, there are customers, we talk on the phone, we laugh, we joke, and they'll tell me in a New York minute, nobody out here does weaves the way you do it. Nobody. Well, the reason nobody does it, maybe somebody somewhere out there does, I'm sure. It's because I got the weave idea with wigs from God. He's the one that gave me that idea as well. So what you find out is the more, the less you follow, and the more you ask God to help you set your own groove, God will tailor-make the gift he's given you so that it's something that no one else can duplicate quite the way you do it. They may be able to do something very similar, but they'll never be able to do it exactly the way you do because you have your own fingerprint. You have your own signature on it. And God will enable you to do things that nobody else can see, let alone do. So what I want to share with you is with God having given you a calling and a gifting, he will show you how to carry it out. He will give you the knack, the understanding. He'll open your mind. Here's another one. One day I was sitting in back of a customer. I had just got to washing the hair and all of that. And I was, I was uh, blow drying. And that's when I really saw the condition of their alopecia areata, which meant they had baldness in spots and hair in spots patches of hair and patches of baldness. I looked at her hair and I said to the Lord, Lord, my eyes were welling up in tears because I got scared. Honestly, I got scared. I said, Lord, she's sitting here trusting me to do something. And Lord, I don't know what to do. I can't see how to make the connection so that the weave will, will attach safely and securely to this woman's hair where it won't be detectable. I really need you to help me lay out a map, a road map or something. I don't know what to do. And right then 
it was as if he put a, a photograph of a map in front of me. And it was the pattern, how I was to make the braids attach, how to attach them, where the, what direction the braid. I mean, I couldn't believe it. When the Lord got through, I could see it and it never left my mind till I got done with the braiding. And when I started sewing the pieces in, it was boom, 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 just like that. See, if you want to be a follower, now I know it, back then everybody did the, they call it the beehive or the whatever they call it, but they have a certain name that they term the way the masses does weaves. I never did weaves like the masses did because I could see the damage it would do down the road where hairlines would recede further and further back. Now, I'm not here preaching about hair. What I'm trying to share with you from my own personal experience is acknowledge God in all your ways. He will direct your path. He will give you ideas, witty inventions. Pat and I were sitting in her house one day up in, in, in Hanford years ago, maybe, three, maybe 25 years ago. I had gone up to visit her and she had this craft room where she was creating all these beautiful uh, uh, potpourri uh, pillows and potpourri this and potpourri that. So it would make the room smell nice, but be functional at the same time. And I said, Pat, I said, let's pray and ask the Lord, you know, what other things we can do. And as soon as we prayed, I saw a skirt. I saw it, just a picture of it, a skirt. And the skirt was filled with potpourri. And I could see how it was made, the cone, I mean, everything, I could just see it. And I said, let's try that. And from that point on, Pat and I both made money off of those dolls, potpourri dolls. I mean, it, was, it wasn't a lot, but it, it made up for paying bills. It was supplementary. But I'm telling you, God will give you ideas, Johnny, on the spot sometimes. That it would never have dawned on you to do. So try things. Ask God. Take your mind out of the box because that will affect the kind of ministry you do. The average person that does ministry does ministry like this, 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 this. But you will do ministry like that. And people will look at you and say, what? What are you doing? Nobody did that before. Why do you have to do that? That's weird. That's not normal. As I said in the skit, that's not normal. Huh. It's not normal. Neither are you. Not if you want to do things God's way. God is a creator. Are you? Are you a creator? Or are you an imitator? Which are you going to be? Because the more creative, more creativity you ask God for, the more creative your ministry will be. The more creative your approach to life will be. The more creative your your uh, overcoming of obstacles will be. You don't have to be like everybody else. Who told you you did? Mm, think about it. You don't have to be like everybody else. You don't have to dance like everyone else, dress like everyone else. Talk like everyone else, quack like everyone else, waddle like everyone else. You don't have to do it like anybody ever did it before. You may have an ashtray, and God may show you a whole different use for that ashtray that can become a beautiful piece of art that you never thought of before. Why? Everybody else used it as an ashtray. Why? Somebody that made that ashtray made it to be an ashtray to catch cigarette ashes and tobacco ashes. But no, God can show you another use. You can repurpose the things that you've already got in your hand without having to spend who gobs of money for something that everybody else gets. Are you willing to venture out 
and create. Ask God. You'll be surprised at the kind of wonders you, you may work for the kingdom of God. The kind of images, the kind of, of items, you, some of you can be inventors. I know I can. I just need to still my little hiney down and ask God to show me some things because he's already shown me some things in my dreams. I already have an applicator for, for, for chemical work on hair. And I'm still waiting on God to show me when to make that move because I have to have it patented and that costs money. So the bottom line is it, you have to be willing to venture beyond, outside of the box. As they said in the movie, Fighting Temptations, act as if there is no box. If you act as if there is no box, there will be no more limits placed on you in your life. You will be surprised at the things you can accomplish when you think without the box. And that without word is has a double entendre meaning. Mm -hmm. It's a double entendre. You think without the box, which means you think with no box. But you also think without the box, which means you're thinking outside of the box. So think as if there is no box to think outside of, and you take all the limits off of whatever you want to do for yourself, your family, your career, and for God, for the kingdom of God. I know what I want to do in ministry. I want to have a Christian, uh, what do you call those things? Um, community, a community center. That's what I'm dreaming. I want to have a community center on my own plot of land, the building I designed myself, that's right, with no architectural knowledge at all. I want to design a building that houses a gym, that houses a racquetball court, that houses a, a tennis court, a basketball court, all interchangeable. It can be changed according to the need and the time of the day. That has pool tables, that has ping pong tables, that has a game room where people can sit and play chess, checkers, all kind of game, table games. They can play spades. They can play all the little games they want to play. But we have rooms for prayer. We have offices for ministry and counseling. And the different members of our church will be doing it. I'm not going to be doing it all. We'll do it together. And if it's too far to travel, there'll be little bedrooms where you can sleep over so you don't have to drive so far if you're going to be at the place for two or three days in a row doing on nonstop ministry. What comes to your mind when you think of ministry? Is it the way everybody else did it? You're going to build a church like they built a church? You're going to build a sanctuary like they built a sanctuary? Huh? You're going to have a ministry like brother so-and-so had his ministry. You're going to do another ministry like sister Appleseed had her ministry. Or are you going to chart your own course? You're going to have your own individual look, your own individual provision, your own individual style. One individual ministry I thought was beautiful. It was original for me. I had never seen it before. A woman had been led by the Lord to open up a chain of cafes. People would come in, get their coffees, all these little nice uh, international coffees and flavored coffees. And they had donuts and snacks and health, health uh, goodies. And they could come in and while they're sitting there, if they need prayer, they can get prayer. If they need counseling, they can get counseling. If they want to get saved, they can get saved. It's a whole different spin on ministry. What, do you, what comes to your mind when you think of ministry? And I end there. Have you asked God to show you? You have not. 
You may say, oh, I don't know what to do. I don't have any ideas. Maybe you have not because you ask not. There's another idea. There's a property right in the middle of all these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of senior homes. And it's sitting there bare and nothing. What a perfect location to have a community center that's Christian-based. Everybody's welcome. They hear the word of God once or twice a week. They get prayer. They get counseling. Different members of our church can come and stay for two or three days a week. Just, just, just cap out, take their showers and have their, have their own little private room while they do ministry on their own schedule, their own way. And watch God move in people's lives. It's not the norm. It's weird. It's different. What has God shown you that you have backed away from because nobody else has done it like that before? Are you willing? You may not be able, but God is able to do all things. He can make things out of nothing. He can do the impossible. He will make a way where there is no way. Do you believe? And I leave you with that. Will you be part of the 300? Or will you go and do it like everybody else has always done it before? Which are you, the 300 or the 9,700 norm? That's only for you to answer and for you to choose. They both serve God. But which would you rather be the number of? The one God chooses or just the one God calls? See, all of them were called, but only 300 were chosen. Hmm. Okay, we'll see which one you are. Time will tell.